Mario Rivalucri, thank you very much. Solution. Is, is that better? Yes. yes. Good. Okay. I um, wanted to start off with a little exercise because the hallmark of our work at Pilgrims is exercises. Principled ones, but exercises uh, rather than bleat. Uh, what I'm going to do um, he here is to, in a moment, I'm to ask you to stand up and do some stuff with me. Okay? Um, one of the things that's kind of strange about language teaching is that we often use conscious ways to do our work. We do a lot of work with the conscious mind of our student. But in actual fact, anybody who speaks a language even half proficiently is speaking it largely from the unconscious. And if, if we can find some exercises which go direct to the unconscious, the whole process is quicker and deeper and easier. And the thing I want to share with you this afternoon is an exercise that uh, I learned from a man called Bernard Dufeu, who is a trainer in the University of Mainz uh, in Germany, and he teaches French. Uh, and this is a group mirroring exercise. Okay, so let me dedicate this exercise to the person I learned it from, whose name is Bernard Dufeu. Can you stand? I hope you can see me where, from where you are. Um, I'm going to ask you to follow my movements. Not only follow them physically, but try to follow them mentally and emotionally. Okay? And also repeat the words. The language I'm going to be using is French. Okay? Some of you have French, some of you don't have French. It's most interesting for the students, for the people in this group who don't have French, in a way. Regarde. 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 Qu'elle est belle. Qu'elle est belle. Qu'elle est très très belle. Qu'elle est très très belle. Elle est extrêmement belle. Elle est extrêmement belle. Incroyablement belle. Incroyablement belle. Quelle belle rose. Quelle belle rose. Accueillir. Je veux l'accueillir. Je vais l'accueillir. Je vais l'accueillir. On y va On y va. Aïe 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 Ça fait mal Ça fait mal Ça fait très mal Ça fait très mal Et pourtant Et pourtant Elle est belle. Elle est extrêmement belle. Elle est très 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 belle. Elle est merveilleusement belle. Je veux l'accueillir. Je veux l'accueillir. Je vais l'accueillir. On y va On y va Oh, quel parfum <laughs> Using those kind of little scenes, you reach into the student's unconscious, especially at a, a musical level, at an auditory level, at a sound level. And not explaining all the grammar and not doing all that intellectual stuff, but actually going direct and giving the feeling and the music of the language. Uh, Bernard's work is fantastic. He published a book called Teaching Myself with Oxford University Press in 1994 and the English language teaching community <laughs> carefully avoided reading it. <laughs> it was reviewed in one or two places. Very often very good books are before their time and that one was. It's a great pity that it went out of print. It's going to be reprinted, Teaching Myself, in Hungary by a small publisher. 
This is sometimes the fate of people who are too far ahead of their time. Um, this afternoon's workshop is about listening and the process of listening and the mysterious things we do when listening. I would like to suggest to you that when we are listening in a normal kind of way, not for an examination, uh, not in other specialised situations, but when we're listening just to ordinary conversations, we do five different things. <laughs> we do them in different proportions, but we do five things. One of the first things we do is to delete. We rub stuff out. If I was to talk to you for a, a moment about my journey from Cambridge to this building, <laughs> there would be a lot of detail about how I got lost between, and maybe you won't believe me, but between King's Cross and here. <laughs> and the number of people whom I asked, and the number of people who didn't want to tell me, and the one number of people who didn't know. <laughs> and if, in all that plethora of detail, you would have got the general message that Mario is pretty unhappy and pretty bad at geography. Okay, but you will certainly, almost certainly, delete many of the little bits of what I've told you. Just, you just get the overall picture of this poor guy getting lost. Um, you also have the phenomenon of distortion. When we listen, we distort. Or we pull around and change. Our own schemata change what's coming in. Okay, let me give you an example. Um, I just wanted to go back for a moment in my own life to when I was 11, 12, 13. My father, who was Italian, was beginning to be preoccupied by the fact that his son Mario, his Italian wasn't developing very well, and that I was still talking fairly rudimentary Italian. So he decided to send me to, on holiday to Italy, to, <laughs> to, the, to a family which he was friendly with. And for two or three summers, I think three summers, I went off for a month or two months <laughs> to stay on the Lago Maggiore, on Lake Maggiore, in North Italy. And now, Lago Maggiore, for those of you who don't know, it is a kind of long, thin slither of water. Its circumference is about 170 kilometres, and I know because I cycled around it in a day once. And the, the, they were, all of those kilometres were very long. Um, uh, it has... Um, it, you can always see the other side, because it's, um, it's a long, thin lake, and you can see right across. It's only maybe three or four kilometres across. Okay? Now, how many people, as you listen to me rabbiting on about Lago Maggiore, brought to mind a lake of their own? <laughs> yes. Tell me about your lake. Let me get back. <coughs> Ah, yes. wow, much so better than mine. <laughs> so the, the, w at which point in my story did your, your volcano lake appear? Uh, I believe when you just mentioned the word lake. Lake, you went to the, the volcano lake. What colours were there? Blue. Blue, Blue. okay. Anybody else get a lake of their own? Yes. I do, when I was a child, my father used to take us to a lake where he used to uh, fish do fishing. Okay. So I remember that very well. He was sitting next to me and he was trying to get us uh, some fish. Um, was it a kind of a lake with a flat side, with flat sides or yes. steep? No, 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 with flat sides. Right. Where was this? In uh, Algeria. In Algeria. So Lago Maggiore evokes the volcano lake, it evokes the lake in Algeria, and that's perfectly normal in terms of everyday listening. When you listen to me talking about my lake, my love and my joy, um, you will go, some of you, to your own lake. Now that means that the resultant stuff that you put into midterm memory is going to be a mixture of what you added and what I gave. And for me, the act of listening, uh, a metaphor for it would be that the Mississippi flow of internal stuff in the listener comes down to meet the ocean coming in. So the other person t talking to me is the ocean coming in, and I, with my own schemata, and the river coming down. And the act of listening is actually a mixing of those two waters. It's a, a mixing of the, the river water and the, and the ocean water. And what we store in midterm memory is the mixture. Certainly not uh, only ocean water. <coughs> Very unusual. So we delete, we got rid, get, get rid of things that don't strike us as important. And why do we do that? We do it because we can't hold all the details too much in, in the conscious mind. 
we distort, we modify, we change. So Lago Maggiore becomes <coughs> the, the, the Algerian lake or whichever. Uh, we generalize. If I give you a whole load of detail about something, um, you will almost certainly, to retain it, you will <coughs> take it up a level, you'll chunk up. So if I was to tell you that um, one of the results of the Pinochet <coughs> revolution in agriculture in Chile after the coup d'etat um, allowed Chile to export <coughs> onions, <coughs> shallots, lettuces, apples, pears, and a huge amount of other <coughs> vegetable projects produced to Japan, you, you, you will generalize the details up into fruit and veg to, in order to remember, because you don't need to remember every example I gave you. It's not the same as deletion, which is knocking out. It's bringing the details up to a higher level, so you can remember them as one chunk. Okay? And then finally, you do elaboration. <coughs> people are always elaborating. Uh, people will create pictures in their minds. <coughs> people will um, <coughs> take something small and make it bigger. And most of this talk this afternoon is going to be about that area of elaboration. One other thing that you do if it's conversational listening is that you begin to prepare for taking the conversation over for your own turn. You begin to mentally prepare for what you're going to say. Okay? So that's the fifth thing that we often do in conversation listening. Now, of course, there are many different types of listening apart from normal general listening that I've described. So, for example, the schizophrenic listening. Schizophrenic people will often not listen to the whole of the syntactic pattern. They will listen to certain vital keywords from their point of view. So the keyword might be food. And they will start going off and creating thoughts around the word food, whatever the keyword in the sentence that strikes them. So this is a particular form of listening, which is not very productive, but it's certainly something that people in that condition will often do. So they'll pick out from the flow of language certain keywords and then construct meanings around that, which may be quite different from meanings intended by the speaker. Um, <coughs> there's language test listening. In a language test, uh, a listening comprehension test, uh, typically with multiple choice questions, um, you will listen to try to retain all the information equally. Because you may get general questions in the multiple choices, or you may get detailed questions. So you have to become a kind of really skillful tape recorder. Yeah? And, and you have to be a tape recorder with an excellent search function so that you can quickly pull out the bits you need. Now that's completely different from uh, other less specialized forms of listening. It's a very odd form of listening, but it's one that has evolved because of what language teachers demand. Um, and then, of course, there's in-depth listening. <laughs> when you listen very, very intently to a person and you try to not only get the meaning, you try to block your own wish to delete, your own wish to distort, your own wish to generalise and to elaborate, and try to stay exactly with that text in its full emotion and musicality. And therapists spend a lot of time learning that kind of listening. Learning that kind of listening that denies self, which <coughs> denies the Mississippi going down to the sea and tries to focus only on the ocean coming in. That's very, very hard, and very few people manage to do it fully successfully, but it, it can be very, very powerful if you do manage to do it, because it makes the other person feel really attended to. Okay? Um, I want to bring you back now to normal listening, to the kind of listening that happens in a, in a, in a normal way, and most of what happens is at an unconscious or semi-conscious level. I mean, when you're listening to something, you don't say, ha, that's unimportant, delete. <laughs> the unconscious mind deletes. It doesn't ask the conscious mind, it does it automatically. Um, what I'm going to do now is to show you how elaboration works by bringing what is normally an unconscious, uh, unconscious pro process into consciousness. So what I'm going to do is to start at word level. And I wanted to give you some words. I'm going to launch the word to you, and I'm going to then ask you to wait for about six or seven seconds until I say, please report, 
And then you turn to a partner, somebody sitting near you, and you report what happened in this extraordinarily brilliant box for your head. Okay? Don't do anything special with the word. Just let it happen. Let your reaction come. And then you turn to a partner and tell them what happened in those five or six seconds. Normally, this happens at lightning speed and unconsciously. Okay, are you ready for the first one? So, when you hear the word, just let it simmer for a moment, and then I'll ask you to report, and then you report to a partner. First word, policeman. And please report to a partner. <laughs> people doing that. I would suggest that this is what Ron Carter has called um, everyday creativity, which every single human being has. I mean, there may be some people with certain medical conditions where they don't do this, but most reasonably normal folk do this automatically, this elaboration, this filling out um, <laughs> things from inside which are evoked by the word coming in. Yeah? And I think this is a marvellous aspect of human beings, that we naturally are so incredibly creative. Um, and I'm going to go up a linguistic level from the word 
uh, to some phrases, and we're going to have to, phrases to do with time, temporal phrases, okay? Same process. Allow a moment of quiet and then report, okay? Are you ready? The first one, late at night, late at night, and report. second thoughts and decided decided to put it down. <coughs> to put it down. Can you write the sentence that follows that one? Whatever sentence comes to your mind. As a group or no, not as a group, as an individual.
You've been sitting now for about 20 minutes, which is a long time even for adults, and definitely a very long time for teenagers. Uh, so can I ask you, um, once you finish writing, to stand up and talk to the partner in the row behind you uh, and read my sentence and your own. Read my sentence and your own. <laughs> process going on in your head. And then when the instruction from me came, please write the next sentence, you will have begun that writing process consciously, but from whatever you did below the level of consciousness as you were taking the dictation. Yeah? That's why, in many cases, people started writing quite soon. There wasn't a great long pause, because the speed of, of unconscious thought is unbelievable. You know, it's sort of mainframe computer kind of speed. While the speed of the conscious mind is pretty slow, comparatively. But the, the, the second sentence there came out of what you did with the first sentence. Yeah? Okay, yeah. let me give you um, a, second, a second sentence. Um, and in this sentence, please write leaving a space between what you've just got on the page and the sentence I'm going to give you. So there's a couple of lines <laughs> between the sentence I dictate to you and the sentence, the, the writing above it, okay? So a little gap. <coughs> Ready? She was overcome by the beauty of what she saw. She was overcome by the beauty of what she saw. Can you write, write the sentence before that one and the sentence after? Write the sentence before and the sentence that follows. They're quite, this is quite separate from the, the, the earlier sentence, okay? So a new exercise. <coughs>
when you have finished writing and when the person sitting next to you has finished writing, can you read the whole little paragraph to them, sentence before my sentence and sentence after? <laughs> with the way some language teachers teach. Because very, very often the questions that they ask the students are based on the original text and not on the elaborated text. Not on what the student did with the text. And that's quite an interesting and serious problem. But before I move into that, and I'm then going to tell you a story so that we move into full text level, um, a little bit of uh, housekeeping. <laughs> the institute that I work for, Pilgrims in Canterbury, has a magazine on the internet called Humanizing Language Teaching. We wanted to call it at the beginning Humanizing Language Teachers. <laughs> we decided that that might be a bit cheeky. <laughs> so we called it Humanizing Language Teaching. It started in 1999. It was quite early in the web development. Uh, and it's now, um, it's now visited by something like 5,000 people per day. It's not like a British Council and, uh, and BBC site, which has many, many more people coming to visit, but it's not too bad for a smallish institute. Um, this is an appeal for writers for the magazine, especially from an audience like this, where you teach many, many different languages. Really very, very interesting for you if you wrote um, something that, that motivates you about <laughs> your thoughts on language teaching. Magazine has, I remember one marvelous article, there was a lady from Ekaterinburg uh, in, in the Urals, uh, in, in, east of the Urals, who wrote an article to her three most pig-like students. <laughs> and she described what little bastards they had. And I'm mean, using her heavy words, because that's the way she put it. She wrote in a fantastic Russian Baroque way, though in English. Um, and then she said, thank you to the three pigs. She said, you have taught me infinitely more than the hundreds and hundreds of really decent, friendly, nice students I've had. So, bastards though you were, thank you very much. <laughs> and then the, 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 that's an example of a practicing teacher really, really saying something that she felt. And I think that the present ed editor, Hanya Kuchewska, is looking for a, 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 as many articles as she can find of that sort, where there is a real powerful personal contact as well as an intellectual one. Um, we send out an email uh, to remind people what's in the magazine. Does anybody get that email? Does anybody? You do. Uh, how, many, how, how often does it come, usually? Um, actually, I've only ever got it once. I don't know how that happened. <laughs> <laughs> Where was that? Um, two or three months ago, something like that. I mean, you should have had another one. It was, it's every two months yeah. the uh, initial goes up. Well, that was the first time I got it. So okay, fine. And what did you give me? Give me some of your address. Oh, it might have been one of them. Were you at the Brass House? In, no, in Ireland, in um, Dublin. Oh, that's, a, that's amazing, because that was two years ago. <laughs> <laughs> in Dublin, yeah. Okay. Uh, 
anyway. Um, <laughs> if things were to work out right, if you put your name and address um, on this bit of paper, name and email address is really enough, um, we will then try to send you an, an email every time a new issue goes up. Uh, can I ask you to pass this back down your row? <coughs> pass it backwards. event in my childhood in a way, the, the, the reading of this book. It was one of the first books that came. I was born in 1940, and then there was a thing called the Second World War, which lasted for five years. And in about 1946, books began to flow into the country from other places. And this book came from Canada. And I still remember the illustrations in the book. It was absolutely amazing, to, amazingly different from the books we'd had around in the UK during the Second World War. Um, and the story is about the bear that wasn't. So the bear was walking um, in the forest. He looked up and he saw the wild geese flying to the south. And the bear thought to himself, ah, when the wild geese fly to the south, it's time to, it's time to hibernate. And then he walked on through the forest and he noticed the yellowy brown leaves falling floating down from the trees. And the bear thought to himself, hmm, when the birds are flying to the south and the yellowy brown leaves are falling from the trees, it's time to go to sleep for the winter. And slowly he shuffled towards the mouth of the cave where he would normally hibernate. He went into the cave and he found some nice dry leaves, crackly ones from the year before, and he piled them up and he lay down and very, very soon, he went into a deep winter sleep. Um, now, this was in October. The beginning of November, some men came to the forest. Um, they were men who came with little, little instruments uh, to look through, and they had little black and white sticks, and they used the instruments to look at the sticks, and they made measurements, and they drew plans. And then these men, who were not very strong, they were kind of fairly flaccid and, uh, <laughs> and non-athletic men, disappeared. And three days later, big, tough guys appeared with massive machines <laughs> and with mechanical diggers and bulldozers. And very, very soon, they knocked all the trees down, carted the, the, the wood away, and began building and digging. And by January... They had finished building this huge, great, ginormous factory right over where the bear was sleeping. Now, bears sleep very deeply in the winter, so he wasn't disturbed. Uh, and in the, beginning of, in the beginning of February, the other men came from the city, <laughs> workers, and they began working in the factory, and the great chimneys of the factory began belching black smoke. Uh, beginning of March, and the bear began to stir. It was somehow beginning to be time to wake up and maybe eat something. And he opened one eye, and he opened the other eye, and he rubbed both eyes, uh, 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 and he saw the light coming from the mouth of the cave, and he lumberingly got up, and he went to the mouth of the cave, and he looked round. Where are the trees? Where's the grass? No, the grass is growing this time. And all he saw were the great chimneys belching black smoke. And he thought, I'm dreaming, I'm still asleep. So he rubbed his eyes very hard and he pinched himself three or four times. Um, and no, it was still the same. And at that moment, a, a man with a, with a peak cap came over <laughs> the factory yard and he said, 
<coughs> Who are you? And the bear said, I'm the bear, sir. <laughs> and, the, and the foreman, this was a foreman, said, You're not a bear! You're a stupid man who wears the sh- a fur coat and needs a shave. And the bear said, But, sir, I'm a bear. <laughs> and the foreman said, Listen, I'm going to be patient with you. I'm going to take you to the third vice president and I'm going to ask him to try to persuade you of who you are. You are not a bear. You're a stupid man who wears a fur coat and needs a shave. And so they went into the third vice president's office and there were two waste paper baskets and two typists and there was a big desk and there was a smallish man, rather bald, sitting behind the desk. That was the third vice president. And the foreman said, he says he's a bear, sir. And the third vice president said, you're not a bear. I need to tell you quite seriously and definitely, you are no bear. You are a stupid man who <laughs> needs a shave and wears a fur coat. And the bear began to say he, say, he said, he said, I am a bear. But there was beginning to be movement in his feeling as to whether he was a bear or not. He'd been generally just woken up from uh, several months' sleep. You can imagine his confusion. And the second vice, third vice president very kindly said to the bear, I don't want to be too harsh on you. I'm going to take you to the second vice president. And so they went to, down a long corridor and they came to another room. And here there were three typists and three waste paper baskets and a bigger desk and a smaller man sitting behind him with less hair. <laughs> and the third vice president said, excuse me, sir, to the second vice president, this strange man says he's a bear. As you can see, of course, he is nothing but a man a stupid man who wears a fur coat and needs a shave. And the second vice president nodded sagely and said, yes, of course you're right, dear colleague. And he said to the bear, you are not a bear. You are a foolish man. And he said, if you, if you, if, um, if you need more persuasion, I will take you right up to the president's office. They went there, but the president was absent. And so there was nothing left to be done than for the foreman to take the bear and put him to do what a man should be doing, which would be working on a machine. And so all through the month of March, April, May, and on, the bear had to pull levers and look at dials and t- turn wheels on this huge machine. And he worked, and he worked all the way through <laughs> the summer, the spring and the summer. And then in September, there was an oil crisis, and the factory had to close down. The men of course, went back to the town where they'd come from. But the bear, the bear walked out into the forest. And he looked up. It was late September, and he saw the wild birds flying to the south. And he thought, it's time to... And he said, I can't... I can't hibernate because I'm a man, I'm a stupid man who wears a fur coat and needs a shave. And then he walked on further through the forest and he saw the leaves falling, fl- fluttering down from the trees. And um, he thought, it's time to hide, 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 hide. And then he stopped himself. He said, I can't hide the maid because, 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 because I'm, I'm a man. <laughs> and so he wandered disconsolately through the forest and it got colder and colder and s- white stuff began to fall. He'd never seen the snow before because he, a proper bear is hibernating at that time. And a long icicle began to form and hung hung down from his nose. And he felt utterly miserable. And then he walked back into the factory grounds. He walked back into the cave. um, And he found some leaves and piled them up. And he lay down. And as he drifted off towards sleep, he thought to himself, I'm not a man. I'm a bear. (laughs) End of story. (laughs) Uh, and I think I like telling this story because I was sent to a boarding school at the age of 13 and I was deeply confused about who or what I was at that time and I think that this story somehow um, has an explanatory effect for me in terms of uh, not being sure of who you are or what you're going to be doing which I spent about a year ago uh, now, I wonder what you were doing as I, uh, uh, as I told that story. Were there some people who went meta and began to have uh, thoughts um, about the business of storytelling? You did. Yeah. So what were you doing in your head? 
Well, I was, I was doing both. I was enjoying the pleasure of listening and at the same time thinking, ah, parallel structures, that's, that's why we really enjoy this, because it's a smaller man at a bigger office. Uh -huh. and, and the parallel structure yeah. would come back in fairy tales. Okay, so you were thinking about the, the kind of symbolic structure of the story. Yeah. In a way. Yeah. Yes? Yeah, I was thinking about capitalism, actually. Uh -huh. <laughs> because of a factory, and this comment was evoked very, very strongly, and uh -huh. people losing their identities. Uh -huh. So you, when did that, that train of thought come into your mind? Oh, the bear, when, when the foreman met him. Uh, when, the, when he was actually, well, I worked at a cheese factory for six months. So yeah. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. okay. So, so, as, so uh, as far as there was the, the intellectual thoughts about capitalism, but there was also um, your own experience yeah. as a factory worker coming in. Yeah. Did, <coughs> did you uh, did, did, did you feel that strongly in parallel to the bear? Kind of. And I was picking up the razor on the, on the floor also. I noticed there was an eraser here. Uh -huh. That's not completely, not, not an upper level, but... No, no, I know that. I was in many places at the same time. Yes, exactly. Yes. Anybody else found that they went meta? Yes. So listening to the work, how you were using your voice, the way you were changing it. Okay, so you were listening to voice control. Yeah, okay. Did some people uh, drift off and go somewhere else? Or think about what you're going to cook for summer? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I had a, um, when, when the bear started interacting with the person, I, start, I went off on a bit of a tangent there, uh -huh. so I started thinking, oh, that's an interesting sort of twist in the story, yeah. and then I started thinking about, well, are there any other stories that I know where that happened? So ah, and you found one? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, there are people who will have found that, thank you for that one, there are people who will have found that other stories came in. Yeah? Yes, what happened to you? Well, I'm sorry. I'm Why are you sorry? You said the first... She's sorry. You said the third she's sorry president, because she's Italian. The third president, you said, yeah. didn't you? Yeah. The third vice president. Yeah. Then you said the second vice president. Yeah. And when the bear was going to see the, the first president, you can guess who I thought of, Berlusconi. Why? Why should... Yes, whatever. Yeah, okay. terrible. I think it's terrible that this, this... That, that image should have come to you. <laughs> <laughs> you hear him or see him or taste no, him No, luckily, or you just in time, you said he wasn't there. And then I said, oh, great. This is all true. Yeah. This is all true. Yeah. So, no, he's not there. Yeah. Thank God. Thank this you. is a very clear example of elaboration from my own experience. Well, I must admit that at, at a stage my mind wanted to wander away as to what I'm going to cook tonight. Yeah. But at the same quite time, no, I was reasonable. trying to unco also concentrate and not miss the storyline. Uh -huh. So you, you so were double tasking? Yes. You, you, you were cooking and you were also. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Good. Yes. I was trying to think where this was leading to, whether you're trying to talk about the environment, you know, whether that was your take. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Then I yeah. tried to stop myself and just focus on oh. the story itself. Yeah, okay. I think I was waiting you, 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 did you notice what the comic before that said? Mm -hmm. uh, what, to three back, was that she said sorry. She started off by apologizing mm -hmm. for being a normal listener. That's an extraordinary <laughs> thing to do. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I was hoping for a punchline. I was sure there was going to be something amazing at the end. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And then it was just kind of. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bad ending. Happy yeah. okay, ending, it's not so bad ending. No, but I'm saying no, normally it yeah. leads up, you, you kind of built up the pressure. Yeah. And I was thinking there must be yeah. some, some amazing Aztec civilization waiting for me. <laughs> <laughs> Next time. <laughs> Did anybody find that other stories came? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I, when you started about taking a number there, yeah. I remember it. So do you run the two stories in parallel for a moment? Yeah, actually I, I, got, I, I got a little bit distracted for a moment. Of course. To think about the play and yeah. that we did last year. Of course, you, you left me and then went off and you came back. Yeah, then I came back, yeah. yeah. There are some people who manage to have two stories running in parallel. They, they, they run parallel films, parallel stories. Okay. Now, um, let me now go and hope that we could do much more work on this if we had time, if we don't. Um, I want you to think now about the sensory elaboration. 
I guess some of you have pictures. <coughs> yeah, did some people get pictures? You got pictures. I good. Good, good, good from this morning. If you remember Ken, was it Ken this morning? He showed us a picture about uh, the Canadian sign in the forest and bears. Because yeah. mm. he gave us a wonderful picture this morning about a uh, sign in, in the woods in Canada saying, you make sure you have your clean. Make sure you have clean underwear on. Yeah. <laughs> or something like that. It was yeah. a public sign. Yeah. So immediately when I spoke to us as well, bears, smell, <laughs> and immediately. Uh, okay. Yes. Yeah, so you get you you've got somebody coming in from the small. Do you realize this is totally normal? Do you realize that this is actually you're just being ordinary human beings, <coughs> hyper creative ordinary human beings. Yeah. Now, I wanted to, to, to explore briefly what you were doing sensorily. Uh, people who got a number of pictures as I tell the story. Yeah. yeah? Who, who did? Okay, can I work with you? Can you, everybody else, can you write down the questions I asked? Just the questions, not the answers. What's your name? Rosie. Rosie, Rosie um, were your pictures black and white or color? They were color. From the beginning? Yeah. Okay. And were they still or moving? They were moving, okay? Did they, when did they start moving? At what point? Um, when the, when the um, smoke started belching out the factory. Ah, at that point, um, yeah, it, okay. Yeah. Once the factory had been built, okay. Up till then they were still. Mm. Okay, were they still, uh, uh, so, yeah, um, they were still up till then. Yeah. Were they big or small, the pictures? Um, large, I don't know. Large, the whole of your head. Not with my brain. Okay. Um, uh, when you say large, are you thinking it's sort of like that picture of uh, uh, that screen, or were they far or near? Yeah. They were inside my head, so there wasn't really a. And I, uh, there wasn't really a size of them, but it was almost as if inside my head I was looking through a silly, a silly thing. Okay. So they were flicking. They were flicking, like in the cinema. Yeah, okay, like in an old cinema. cinema. Because you were, because you were talking about different um, scenes. Okay. Yeah. Um, <coughs> so they flickered when there was a change of scene. Yeah. Uh, were your pictures with a frame, or did they go off into space? No. Space. Sorry. Space. Went off into space. Yeah. Were you actually at any point in the picture? I mean, in the space rather than in the picture. You know, in a dream, sometimes you can be in the in the space of the dream rather than looking at it from outside. It was more that it kind of zoomed in and out, as in, ah. as if it were... Like a camera uh, zooming in and out. when you're talking about the chimney, so it yeah. zoomed in and all I could see was the top of the chimney. <coughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But then a lot of the other Jurassic story I just saw from the face. You, you just what? You were hiding in the face. So um, you, you were actually in the, in the space. <laughs> you were actually in the space. Um, the party. So, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, in the second half. Yeah, the first thing. Uh -huh. Which is a bit bizarre because some of it was in offices. But that's what you did. Don't deny what you did. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I guess, parallel. You were in parallel space. Parallel space. Parallel space. Yeah, okay. Um, sometimes people don't have external pictures. Sometimes they find themselves in the space where the action is taking place. You're the. Rosie, you're the, it's the first time I've met someone who was in the parallel space. But then <laughs> the nature of this work is exploratory, so I'm delighted. Thank you for being in a parallel space. <laughs> uh, can you now uh, turn to your partner and very quickly try to find out the nature of their pictures if they got pictures? If they didn't get pictures, ask them about the sound. <laughs>
very much more extraordinary detail and life in there than I put in there. Uh, you've got um, <laughs> the equivalent of 30 pages of a novel in terms of verbal description. And you did that in five, ten minutes. Okay? Now, um, let me just change role. Um, <laughs> what colour uh, were the leaves as they fluttered down from the trees? Um, well, uh, I'm assuming that they would be yellow. Yellow, I think. Yellow, green. You think they were yellow? I think they were. Or they may have been green. Might have been green. Mm -hmm. What <laughs> mark do I give <laughs> I talked very clearly about the colour, yellowy brown. Yellowy brown. <laughs> Please pay more attention. <laughs> <laughs> um, what do we know about the management structure of the company? It's missing a first vice president. There was a four man. There were three vice presidents. And? Well, there was actually two vice presidents and a president. Uh, no, but they, did, uh, they, they left one out. But it's uh, it, it, it three, two. It's three, two. And who else? Four okay. yeah. workers. Um, the, the nature of the leaves in the cave when the bear first went into hibernate? Crackly. 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 Uh, from which year? Last do you see how stupid this question is? <laughs> <laughs> Do you see how absolutely asinine they are? What does it matter? That was what we whether the fluttering leaves are yellowy brown or yellow, as you said. Yeah. It's absurd. And what I'm doing is I'm asking you linguistic questions about the dead text of Mario. And I'm ignoring what you've done. Isn't that a perverse idiocy? <laughs> and isn't this normal across all language teaching? Don't you accept that, uh, didn't you have a moment of guilt that you couldn't give me a proper good student answer? I did, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I shall remember you forever as the student of life. <laughs> I mean, I know I'm paranoid. <coughs> you understand how stupid it is to go back to the dead text and not to pay attention to the text that you have created is an absurd behaviour on my part. So, big question mark about the role of so-called comprehension questions um, in language teaching. If you go to the BBC uh, plus um, British Council website, I ran a blog for them uh, this time last year, and there's an article there uh, about the whole problem of the comprehension question. If you want to follow up, that might be a nice place to go. Um, I think I need to stop there because there are other people who are going to work. Um, I have these books on display <laughs> and if you want to buy any, they're all each, each are 12 quid, which is a decent discount from what you pay in the shops. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mario. That was a, a you know, lovely...